Okay, good morning, ladies. Can you hear me okay? Well, the first thing I want to say, I sound really loud, but the first thing I want to say is I want to tell you guys about a blessing that I received last week, and it came in the form of your table leaders because Jackie delivered a bag to me, and it was just full of notes of encouragement. And I just can't tell you how that blessed my heart. So thank you for those notes. Uh, They'll carry me these next nine weeks. And then the other thing I wanted to say is, and hopefully this is gonna work. It works. The little clicker works. Um, If you survived the spaghetti bowl of the Old Testament overview last week, turn to your neighbor and say, good job. (laughs) That's important. So when you think of all the different events that took place in the nation of Israel, and you look at this chart and you think about it, it can be pretty crazy. Um, And I don't know about you, but can your life ever kind of feel like this? Um, Just a little bit crazy, one story overlaps to another story, and then their story overlaps on your story. And if you think about it, it's kind of like a tapestry. I don't know if anybody's ever given you that illustration. But if, you tur- if you're looking at it from the back, you just see all these strings. And if you've ever done you know, needlework, there's just strings everywhere and it doesn't really make any sense. And we might wonder even in our own lives sometimes, what is God doing? Because my life just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And then one day we'll be able to look back and see all those loose threads and how the master weaver weaves together a beautiful life that makes sense in his kingdom. So let me pray for us as we get started this morning. Father, I just come before your throne this morning, Lord, which is the best place to start, on our knees, remembering who you are, Lord, and that um, I'm surrendering my heart this morning, Lord, and I pray that each woman here surrenders her heart and that she is leaning in and ready to receive what you have for her through the life of Nehemiah. Lord, help us to listen, help us to learn, and then, Lord, help us to apply these truths to our lives. It's in your precious name, amen. So the first thing I want you to do is open your study guide to the very back, because I'm gonna refer to that timeline. So like I said, last week we talked about the nation of Israel and where they were at that point in history. And we remember that God warned the people to obey him and he also told them of the consequences if they didn't obey him. So that's where they are now. Because of their disobedience, they're in 70 years of exile. And if you look with me at the Jeremiah 25, 11 and 12 um, passage again, it says, this whole country will become a desolate wasteland and these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation, the land of the Babylonians for, the guilt, for their guilt, declares the Lord and will make it a des- desolate forever. This is exactly what happens. And we remember that, Nehemiah, I mean, that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar came three different times to the people of Israel to sack the southern kingdom of Judah. And we remember that those came in waves, the first being in 605 BC, when Daniel and his companions were um, taken as the first captives. And then we remember in 586 BC that Jerusalem, that's when it was completely destroyed by the Babylonians and the Jews were now in exile. The first, like I said, being Daniel. Uh, So they destroyed the Southern Kingdom. What did they do? They burned down the gates, they destroyed the walls and they carried the people into exile over a thousand miles away. But what does God say next? He says in, whoops, I went too quick. He says in Jeremiah 29, 10, but when the 70 years are complete for Babylon, I will come to you and I will fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. So here we are in Nehemiah where God is fulfilling that promise after those 70 years. We also remember that the Persians were the ruling power of the day. Um, And and King Cyrus decrees, remember, that the Jews can return to their land in about 538 BC, as you see on your timeline. And we remember that the first waves came with Zerubbabel, 
And they came to rebuild the temple. It was completed after 22 years in 516. The second wave was with Ezra, who we know was the priest and the scribe in 458. And then that third wave is where we find ourselves in Nehemiah, which was about 444 or 445 BC. Why do you think God allowed those three waves of exiles to return to the land in the order that they did? They rebuilt the temple. They return with the, the scribe, with Ezra, the scribe and the priest, and then with Nehemiah to rebuild the wall. God allowed it in that sequence because without a spiritual foundation in place, restoration will not take place or be able to be maintained. Remember, several governors had already tried to rebuild the wall, but they failed. Our restoration starts with a spiritual foundation too. If your life is not right with Christ, you don't have anything of value to build your life on. Psalm 127.1 says, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. And the principle that we wanna remember here is if you wanna rebuild the rubble in your life or restore something, it starts with Christ as your foundation. And the Israelites, they knew that this was essential to have a spiritual foundation laid as their first priority, but how do they prioritize? How do you prioritize? What does your to-do list look like? What makes it at the top of your list each day? Does God get the best part of your day? Does he get the best of your time and your talents and your treasures? These exiles learned the hard way that God needs to be the first priority in their lives. So go ahead and open your Bible with me to Nehemiah chapter one, which I hope you've brought with you. I hope that you have your actual Bible so that you can take notes in the margin uh, about what stands out to you, maybe put a date. Uh, maybe God is speaking to you specifically and you wanna write that date down so that you can look back and remember God's faithfulness. Now remember, we're studying Nehemiah, but we're also leaning in so that we can hear and apply what it is that God has for us this morning. So last week, we talked about those first few verses in Nehemiah, but I'm gonna back up just a little bit uh, and cover a few things that I didn't talk about last week. He told them the when, which was in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. Back then, that's how they dated things. It was based on the year of the reigning king, whatever year the king was in. So they dated things based on that, but it was actually about 444 B.C., then he tells us the where, which was the citadel of Susa, which was the winter palace of the king. He gave us the who that gave him the message, and that came from his brother, Hanani. And that means, though, that Hanani had to have come back with one of those three waves from um, exile. And remember his name, because it's gonna be important when we get to chapter seven. And then he gave us the what, the Jews, who survived the exile, returned to Jerusalem. And what was the what? It was because the walls uh, were, because they were in great trouble and disgrace. So we remember, like I said, that the walls are broken down and have been burned. So last week we talked about what it would look like in your life if you lived in a house and you had no walls and you had no doors. And this is what their lives were like. They had nothing to protect themselves or their families. So this week in verses four through 20, we're gonna talk about what Nehemiah's heartfelt response is to the situation and then how he expressed that through prayer to God. We're gonna see a wonderful example of what prayer looks like and we're gonna look at an acrostic to apply to our prayer lives. We're gonna look at some incredible leadership qualities that we see in Nehemiah. And we're also gonna recognize that Nehemiah is an archetype of Christ. And if you remember from Genesis, how neat that was to see. And what an archetype is, that just means somebody that is a symbol that points forward to Christ. So these are the th three things that we're gonna look at that are woven through um, this first chapter. And Nehemiah says in verse four, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. This prayer, ladies, is the first of 12 prayers in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah begins and it ends with prayer. 
So one of the first great qualities of a leader is they know how to prioritize. You may be saying to yourself, well, I'm not in a leadership position, but we are all in leadership positions. All of us are leaders in some capacity. You might have children at home, but you are leading those children. You might work outside your home. Maybe you work here um, at Faithbridge, but we're all an ambassador for Christ. Whether you're on the HOA board or the PTO or your room mom or whatever, you are a leader for Christ. So your witness matters. So a great leader knows how to prioritize and they do first things first. And the first priority of a great leader is prayer. The first thing Nehemiah did was he unburdened his heart to God. He prayed frequently and fervently, and he prayed about almost everything. What Nehemiah knew was that the walls were torn down, the gates were destroyed, they were in great trouble and distress, and have you ever had a burden like that? I mean, have you ever just felt like things are just kind of falling apart and you sat down and you cried over it? If you remember um, Jen Wilkin, when she was talking about Jacob, when we studied Genesis, she talked about kind of what a crybaby he was. Remember, he cried a whole lot. <laughs> um, but Nehemiah, he cried, but he cried for the right reasons. Um, it was actually a sign of the strength of his character. Nehemiah was like Jesus in that instance because he was willing, he willingly shared the burden, excuse me, that was crushing his fellow Jews. Psalm 69, nine says, for zeal for your house consumes me and the insult of those who insult you fall on me. And then in Romans 15, two and three, it says, each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. And maybe you've even found yourself fasting and praying about a situation. And Nehemiah did all of that, but what we'll see in the, in, uh, the chapter that we look at next week is that God moved his heart in response to that conviction and that burden. And when God wants to use us or God wants to move us in a direction, what he often does is he puts that burden on our heart. He moves us to a place of conviction. And I know some of you in this room. I know the different ministries that God has convicted and burdened your heart with that have moved you out to actually do something about it. God always moves first, ladies. Don't ever think that your idea is what brought things to fruition. It is God that is moving in your heart and first. So what was, uh, why was Nehemiah so burdened with the people? Because they were harassed and they were helpless, again, pointing us to Christ. Matthew 9, 36 and 38 tells us that Jesus, when he was going through all the towns and villages and he was teaching in the synagogues and giving the good news and healing people, it says he did that why? Because they were harassed and they were helpless and they were like a sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Nehemiah's heart of compassion is moved when he hears the distress of his fellow Israelites. That in and of itself is amazing because they were a thousand miles away from him and he didn't even know a lot of them personally. And when you and I see a need, what do we often do? What do we often say? I know I do it, so I'm hoping someone else is in here with me. When we see a need somewhere, what do we say? Well, geez, somebody needs to do something about that. After all, Nehemiah was a, I'm gonna mess this up. <laughs> he, Nehemiah was a bartender, not a builder as one commentator said. He was a cupbearer, he wasn't a contractor. God was calling him completely outside of his comfort zone. But when God puts something on your heart, don't miss the blessing that he has for you. If he's putting it on your heart, maybe you're the one that's supposed to actually do it. And God had Nehemiah right where he was supposed to be. He was positioning him for the vision that he was calling him to. And God will use your present circumstances that you find yourself in right now to prepare and position you for what he has next in your own life. Nehemiah had no idea that he would need to be working for King Artaxerxes at that point in time when God would make the call for him to go. 
Him being next um, to the king in such a highly regarded position was very significant. He had no idea that it would be this king that he would need and the resources of this king to rebuild those walls in Jerusalem. But God knew it and he had him where he wanted him. Remember the back of that tapestry, all those loose threads, but God was weaving together a beautiful picture. And if you know uh, much about the Old Testament, you remember that God tested Joseph and enslaved him before he became before he came into command in Egypt. And remember that Moses, he tended sheep for 40 years before God used him. And then David spent years running for, from Saul before he uh, became king. So God wastes nothing. Don't discount where God has you right now. And where does it say that Nehemiah was while he mourned and fasted and prayed? It says that he was before the God of heaven, the only one who had the power to change the circumstances in Jerusalem. Where do you go when you are at your wit's end? Like probably many of us, do we go to the phone before we go to the throne? Nehemiah was the kind of man that any of us would wanna follow because he knew how to prioritize and his priority was prayer. Abraham Lincoln was a man of prayer and he said, I have been, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of those about me seemed insufficient for the day. But he knew, as your note, as your study guide pointed out, that nothing is impossible for God. Cyril Barber, who also wrote a study on Nehemiah, said, the self-sufficient do not pray, they merely talk to themselves. The self-satisfied will not pray, they have no knowledge of their need. And the self-righteous cannot pray because they have no basis for which to approach God. So we need to ask ourselves, do I have more of an ongoing conversation with myself or with God? And do I realize that God has the power to change my circumstances? And if so, is prayer my first priority? Why do I, where do you need to reprioritize something in your life so that prayer can take the place that it needs to? So here we are at the beginning of the year and it's often this time of year, we kind of look back at the previous year and we check our walls for cracks or um, gaps or wreckage or whatever. And we make resolutions to do better. I don't know about you, but I, I do do that. And one commentator said, uh, reflected on why it's so hard for us to keep those resolutions, why we experience also so much failure. We don't recognize how desperately we need God as a necessary part of the change and restoration process of our lives. What does our society teach us? We just, I just heard the ladies talking about this at a table I sat at. What does our society teach us? You can do it. If you have enough time, if you have enough money, if you have enough energy, if you work hard enough, you can accomplish anything. And I can tell you as a type A personality, self-sufficiency is a pit that I can fall into myself. But Nehemiah shows us that the only way, um, that only with God's help can we actually change ourselves and recover some of the ruin of the damage in our past. And this is a central theme that we're gonna see throughout the book of Nehemiah. And here in Nehemiah is where we're gonna see this great acrostic. Um, I've applied it to my prayer life for many years. I don't know if you've seen it or if you've used it. How many of you have used this in your prayer life or you're familiar with it? Okay, good, so some of you have. So the first one we're gonna look at is A for adoration. Nehemiah is looking back and he is remembering who God is. The first thing uh, he does is he pours out adoration 
for God. He's worshiping who God is. He says, Lord, the God of heaven, you are a great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who whom he with those who love him and keep his commandments. This is the God that Nehemiah prayed to day and night. He knows that God is sovereign and God is faithful and God is loving, and he doesn't proceed to the other areas of his prayer until he reminds himself of who he's directing his prayers to, the God of heaven who is great and awesome and keeps his covenant. God made a covenant with his people Israel, promising to richly bless them if they obeyed him, and he also warned them of the consequences if they didn't. But God never removes his covenant of love from us. He, Nehemiah knew that sin brings consequences, but he also knew that God loved them. God clearly warned the people back in Leviticus chapter 26. He said again and again, if you do this, I'll do that. I'll send rain. I'll grant peace to the land. I'll look on you with favor. I'll make you fruitful. I'll increase your number. But like the Israelites, why are we so surprised when we live outside of God's will in our life and then we find ourselves in the consequences of the choices that we make? The Lord goes on to tell them exactly what will happen as a result of their disobedience, that the city of Jerusalem would be in ruins, the nation of Israel would be in trouble and in disgrace because they sinned against the Lord. Did you notice what Nehemiah does though? He appeals to God because he knows that God is attentive to his people just like he is to us. He says in verse six, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayers your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people Israel. And then the second one we'll look at in the ACTS is confession. He says in verse six, I confess the sins we Israelite, including myself and my father's family, have committed to you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed your commands, decrees, and laws that your servant Moses gave us. There it is. He is stating exactly why they find themselves in the mess that they're in. He appeals to God on the basis of the promises that God made to them. He's pleading God's loving kindness to his people through the confession of sin. Do we confess like that? Or do we beat around the bush? Well, I wouldn't have sinned if she wouldn't have started it. Or if she wouldn't have brought it up, I wouldn't have gossiped either. I got, she made me sin. Or it's all her fault. Now, I know y'all don't say that, but I'm sure your kids do, right? But not Nehemiah. He states the sin and he takes ownership for that sin and the sin of his father and the nation. And like Ezra, he identifies himself with the people. And we see that, um, we'll, we're gonna see that again in chapter nine. Nehemiah, he stands with the people. He could have said, well, I wasn't even there when all this happened. I was a thousand miles away. This happened before I was born. He could have brought in all kinds of excuses. But a quality of a great leader is that a great leader recognizes that he or she is just as weak and capable of sin as anybody else. Pride, ladies, is a slippery slope and the Bible warns us that it precedes a fall. I love what John Piper says. Um, he's a favorite of mine about repentance. He said, a vague bad feeling that you're a crummy person is not the same as conviction of sin. Feeling rotten is not the same as repentance. When we specifically state our sins, they come out of hiding. We can look them in the eye and not just whine about them, but we can apologize to God for not doing the things that he asks us to do. We can point to them, we can repent of them, we can ask for forgiveness of them, and we can take aim this is my favorite part, with the gospel bazooka to blow them up. Love that. I hope that sticks in your mind. The gospel bazooka. 
Why? Because Satan loves for us to keep our sins hidden and not confess them and receive the cleansing and the renewal that God is offering us through the confession of sin. Uh, Satan would rather have us in bondage to that guilt than taking out that gospel bazooka and saying there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. This was the promise Nehemiah was claiming um, when he prayed. He prayed that for himself and he prayed that for the nation. But let's be real. In our quiet time or our time before the Lord, what do we often do first? We bring our laundry list to God of what we want or what we think we need. And often if time is left over, we might spend a minute or two in confession. The Christian way, writes Martin Luther, essentially consists in acknowledging ourselves to be sinners and in praying for grace. Okay, the third one we're gonna look at is T for Thanksgiving, the third element. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. He's praying that back to him from uh, Deuteronomy 30, verses two and four. Nehemiah knew the promises of God. Here, Nehemiah is referring to the covenant promise that was made in Deuteronomy that has two sides, one for blessing and then one for judgment or consequences. It was conditional. It said if the people obey, then God would bless them. And if not, he would scatter them, uh, which is exactly what happened to the Northern and Southern kingdom. But what we don't see explicitly stated that's here is that Nehemiah is grateful and he's thankful to God that there is a means of blessing. It comes in the form of obedience. He reviews this promise because it suggests a time of blessing if the people repent. We have that same blessing and aren't we thankful? How many times have you heard obedience brings blessing? And then the fourth one is supplication, which is just a fancy name for request. It's asking God for what you need. He's acknowledged and worshiped God for who he is. He's confessed his sin. He has reviewed the promises um, and gratefully reviewed the promises of God. And now he's laying his request before the Lord. Oh, I'm in adoration. I skipped too quick. This is because I wanted to go back. It says here in verse 10, they are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Again, throughout his prayer, he's pouring out that adoration and remembering who God is. He is great, he is mighty, and he is powerful. There's the supplication. So verse 11 says, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayers of your servant into the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. So finally, Nehemiah is getting to the point and he's stating specifically what he's asking God to do. He's asking God for success in the next step. John Piper says, and again, I quote, prayer makes things happen that would not happen if you didn't pray. James 4.2 says, you do not have because you do not ask. It doesn't mean you would have anyway, even though you didn't ask because I have a plan. You have not because you ask not. It means things wouldn't happen if you didn't pray. This is why this is a staggering, glorious privilege that the God of the universe would ordain that prayers cause things to happen. Piper goes on to say, if you don't avail yourself to the privilege of prayer, you are acting like a colossal fool. If we're offered the privilege of engaging with God in such a way that your request could bring about things that would otherwise not come into being, not to avail yourself to this privilege is folly. God is beckoning us into our share of running the universe. 
And that's where your mind goes. Hashtag, don't be the fool who doesn't pray. Do I fully understand prayer? No. Does it mean that everything I pray and ask for God to do happens? No. I pray because God tells me to. And I pray on the same basis that Nehemiah does, because he is a loving God who hears the prayers of his people. And he answers those prayers in accordance with his goodwill. James tells us that the prayers of a righteous man or woman are powerful and effective. Who is the righteous? Who are those righteous? Those of us who have exchanged our sins for the righteousness of Christ. Those who know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And when do we pray? When are we supposed to pray? On all occasions, with all kinds of prayers, with all kinds of requests. Yes, that means the lost car keys, the lost shoes, the lost dog. That means prayers for safety, prayers for thanksgiving, prayers for forgiveness, and prayers that focus on the promises of God. But to be able to pray those promises, and there are some beautiful ones listed in your study guide this week. We talked about it at the table. Those are prayers to know, record, and pray back to God. Be in God's word every day. That's how you know what he says and what you can pray back to him. So the founder of BSF, who um, in my opinion is a great um, giant in the faith said, perhaps because prayer is so powerful, it is the most contested exercise in a believer's life. Notice the word exercise. Prayer does not come naturally. It's a discipline and it's probably one of the most difficult battles that you're gonna have in your faith journey. And it's one that requires concentrated effort and determination. I read that one of the most violent things that you can ever do is to wrestle down the competing elements in your calendar and consistently carve out time to shut your wet yourself away in that secret place of prayer. Why? Because prayer changes things. Prayer, ladies, is where the battles are won, and Nehemiah knew he had a battle ahead of him. He says, this man, or in verse 11, when he says, this man, he's referring to King Artaxerxes that we'll talk about in the next chapter. He knew that this king was the key to the plan that God placed on his heart And he knew that God was key in moving that man's heart to do what needed to be done. Proverbs 21.1 is a beautiful um, verse to remember. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. Ladies, we have an election right around the corner. I know that comes as a surprise. But I want to remind you of something. Our help does not come on Air Force One. Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. James Boyce, another that I've studied, quotes Hudson Taylor. He says, it is possible to move men through God by prayer alone. I want to repeat that. It is possible to move men through God by prayer alone. I don't know about you, but one thing I've learned in my 57 years is that I cannot change the heart of another person. A wise friend of mine says, don't nag them, and I would probably say husbands first. Don't nag your husbands, don't nag your kids, don't nag your friends, whomever you decide to nag. Nag God, because God is the only one that has the power to change a heart. So let's not miss one more element with a great leader, and that is that they persist in prayer. We know that Nehemiah did because it tells us in the beginning of this chapter that it was in the month of Kislev, uh, and that meant, let's see. Okay, in the month of Kislev, word came to Nehemiah about the state of things. And as we learn in the beginning of chapter two, that it was in the month of Nisan. So, Kislev corresponds to November or December, 
and Nissan corresponds to March and April. So that was about four or five months later. So what that teaches us is that Nehemiah petitioned God regarding Jerusalem before his prayers were answered for about four to five months. So a great leader persists in prayer. But, and Boyce said, before he persevered with men and went to Jerusalem, he persevered with God in prayer first. And what's the last thing that Nehemiah says in this chapter? And by the way, I was cupbearer to the king. Why do you think he added that at the very end? I think he added it because he didn't put himself first. Instead, he makes prayer to the Lord a priority and he puts the needs of others first and he just talks about himself and who he is last. And he really doesn't even tell us that much about himself. But what does it mean to be the cupbearer to the king? Well, it does mean more than serving the king wine and food. Um, he does do that though, obviously. But it also means that he gets to eat and drink the best. Cushy job, right? Uh, he lived in the palace. He probably wore really nice clothes. He slept in a really nice, um, comfy, cushy bed. But because assassination was a very real threat to the king, you could say that Nehemiah's life was a risk and reward type of job. And we learn in Daniel uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, it kind of gives us a little bit of an idea about what Nehemiah may have been like or how he was trained. It tells us, then the king ordered Aspenaz, chief of the court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians, the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were trained for three years, and after that, they entered the king's service. So likely, Nehemiah was well-trained for the job as the cupbearer. He was given daily food and wine from the king's table so that he would know good wine from bad wine and good food from bad food. Haven't you ever heard, no wine before it's time? Well, he was trained in all that. So yes, he got to drink all the good stuff. Uh, he wasn't drinking the boxed wine he, that was prepared for the king. The king was in constant fear of somebody trying to overtake his throne. And one of the easiest ways they could do that was by poisoning the king. And that's actually what happened to his father, King Xerxes. He was killed by one of his servants. So the cupbearer would help guard against this. And again, risk and reward but Nehemiah would have had to be a person of great integrity and trusted immensely by the king. He was most likely a personal confidant and advisor to the king. And next to the queen, the cupbearer was the closest to the king. And from a Christian perspective, the role of the cupbearer takes on a new meaning for us. We believe as Christians that there is no king but God, that he's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. Does God have a cupbearer? He does. In the Garden of Gethsemane, in Matthew 26, 39, what does Jesus say? He prays to the Father and says, my Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath, the poison of sin on our behalf. He drank it to the dredges for all humanity. Like Jesus sits at the right hand of God, Nehemiah has regular access to King Artaxerxes. And like Jesus, we'll see how Nehemiah willingly gave up a position of royalty and comfort to come to the aid of the people, the Israelites. So we find out who Nehemiah is after we find out who he puts his faith in, the God of heaven. God was moving in his heart and he prayed. He knew that he needed the help of the king of kings before he came before King Artaxerxes. We saw that a great leader makes prayer a priority. If you don't take anything else away today, I hope you recognize the importance of prayer in your life and in the life of your family.
We see that a great leader recognizes that he or she is just as weak and sinful as the next person. And finally, that perseverance is also the mark of a great leader. We can't miss how the Old Testament always points forward to Christ, and we saw that in Nehemiah as an archetype of Christ this morning in this first chapter. So next week, we're gonna focus on chapter two, and we're gonna watch how God, in amazing ways, blazes the trail with all the things that Nehemiah needs to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall. We'll see how the prayers that Nehemiah prayed are actually what laid the foundation for Nehemiah to move forward in preparation to rebuild the wall and to lead the people. Let me pray.